Thank you, Miss Brenda. It's so good to have you back. <laughs> we missed you last Sunday. I missed you last Sunday. Hey, take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. And we want to start reading this morning in verse number 22. Ephesians 5, verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husbands. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this Lord's Day, and thank you, Father, for leaving us instructions about our home life. We pray, Father, that you would help us to humble ourselves before you. Lord, help us to realize that we're not dealing with the opinions of men. But Lord, as we approach the Word of God, we're dealing with what thus saith the Lord, what the Scripture teaches about the home. And Lord, there's not a single person in this service that have not faced some difficulties in this area of their life. Lord, some of us have even had our hearts just crushed and broken. But Lord, we're glad that you have the answer to meet all of our needs. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do the work of, of applying the truth to everyone that's in this service. And Lord, that you'd help us to see through the eyes of Christ, Lord, how important it is that we would submit ourselves to your word. I pray, God, that you would grant me favor today. Lord, I pray for grace. I ask that you'd help me, Lord, to be able to say the things that needs to be said. But, Lord, help me also to say it in the spirit that it needs to be said so that I might be able to communicate, Lord, your truth in the way, God, that you intend for us to hear it. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that we might just bend to your will and obey your voice, and please you in all things, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Well, last Sunday morning, we looked in Genesis chapter number 2, and we noticed how that God is the originator of the home. When God created Adam, he formed him out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then God had all the animals parade before Adam. And out of all the creatures in the earth, there was not found a sufficient companion for Adam. So God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, and out of Adam's rib, God created woman. 
And God said concerning the woman that she was his help me, fit, perfect, perfect in companionship for Adam was the woman. And since God is the originator of the home, God is also the organizer of the home. Since he is the one that has established the home and he is the creator and founder of the home, he's the one that, and the only one that really has the right to give us instructions about how that home should function. He's the only one that has wisdom to know how the home should function. Because he's the all-knowing God, there's nothing that God does not know, then what God records in his word is for our good. It's for our benefit. It's for our blessing that he would give us instruction about how the home life should be organized and structured so that the husband would be blessed in his relationship with his family. So the wife would be blessed in her relationship and so that the children also would be greatly blessed. I think the difficulties that we face in our day when we come to the Bible is that men so ridicule and criticize and blaspheme against God that we no longer take God at His Word as though He is the final authority over every issue in life. I was sharing this quote with my wife and daughter Carrie from the book that Richard Dawkins wrote about the God delusion, and he says this concerning God. I quote, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous, and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynist, homophobic, racist, and he just keeps on going on and on. Now as I'm reading that, some of you are probably a little bit angered that I would even repeat that in the Lord's house. You don't like hearing those types of things about the great God who is a God of love and compassion and mercy and tenderness and long-suffering. That's the Bible description of our great God. But you see what many people have done is they have fashioned in their own mind a God that cannot even be found in the Bible. When I was little and unsaved, just a child, I used to view God maybe not as blasphemous as Richard Dawkins did, but somewhat in that same light that he was a God who just could not wait to execute judgment on me and to punish me. And I didn't have a true understanding of who the Bible God is or the God of all creation really is. And the danger that's facing America today is that men are fashioning in their own mind a concept of God that's totally untrue about his character and his nature. In Romans chapter 1, the Bible said that they changed the truth of God into a lie. And it goes on and describes a time when men knew God but were not thankful that he was God. And so they fashioned in their own mind an image of God that was not a correct image whatsoever and they likened him unto four-footed beasts and even bugs and insects. And if that's your view of God when you come to passages like this in Ephesians chapter number 5, instead of wondering what is it that God is trying to help me to see in this passage, you may recoil because of words that you hear and say, well, I refuse to look into that any further because of some of the words that God uses to describe this. I want you to understand something, that God is not misogynistic, that is a woman hater. In all of creation, God has exalted His creation. He has honored His creatures. He loves every single one of us. He loves us so much that He was willing to come to this earth, robe Himself in flesh, and walk up Calvary's hill 
and suffer and bleed and die so that your sins could be paid for through His death and sacrifice so that you could be saved by grace through faith, that not of, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words, He loved you so much that He was willing to go through all of that so that you could have forgiveness of your sins. Remember John 3.16, For God so loved... And boy, those two words have great meaning. Amen? The world that He gave His only begotten Son. You see, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, there's neither Jew or Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean that there's no gender distinction. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the Jew is not greater than the Greek. He's saying that the free man is not better than the slave. And he's saying that men are not better than women. In fact, he's saying we all are equal in Christ. But in that equality, we have different roles and different functions. And we're required by our Creator who made us the way that He made us to behave ourselves in those roles and in those functions. You see, we're living in a day that men are so rebellious against God, and I hope that you take this in the spirit I'm trying to present it, that they're not even satisfied with the gender that God has made them. And that's why we have men who are claiming that they are women, and we have women who are claiming that they are men because they are not pleased with what God has done in their life. And because that they've changed the image of the true God and they've corrupted their view of Him, instead of realizing God is the one who's made me this way, they act in a rebellious way saying, God, I don't care how you made me, this is how I'm going to live my life. Not realizing that they would find greater joy, deeper happiness and contentment simply by submitting to the way the Creator had made them. So though the Bible says that we're equal, we each have different roles and responsibilities in life. And Paul comes to the subject of the home. And I'd like to challenge you if you really want to try to discern what does the Bible say about what God, how God wants me to behave myself and live in this world, that you would go back even and take the home in the full context of the entire book of Ephesians. We did not begin our reading in verse 21, but Paul is talking about walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, being controlled by the Holy Spirit. He's talking, when he's defining this home, he's talking to spiritually mature, well-developed Christians that are wanting to do all that they do to honor and glorify God. He says in verse 18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, or be under the Holy Spirit's control. And then he gives the instruction concerning the Christian life. He says in verse number 19, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And so even in the church, we have this responsibility of having a submissive spirit toward one another in this world. And so the first one Paul addresses in the home is the wife. Because he wants to show how this is lived out in a practical way. He's not coming to the wife first just so that women would be first. <laughs> Most of the time when you find the role of the husband, wife, and children in the home, the husband is always addressed first. 
But here, Paul addresses the wife's role in the home first, implying that the heart of the home's harmony rests in the wife. The heart of the of the home's harmony rests in the wife. In other words, if the wife fails to fit into this God-ordained role, then usually the home fails. Now that doesn't mean that the husband doesn't have a higher responsibility and accountability and the children don't have a vital role in that, but simply meaning that that wife has such a a critical role in that home that much of that home's development and happiness really depends on that wife following the lordship of Jesus Christ. In fact, you could say that the church's problem in our day is that we don't understand our role in Christ's headship. How many would say amen to that? Uh, A lot of the churches today are not understanding that we are to be submissive to the Lordship of Christ, Christ's will, Christ's desire, Christ's word, that we are to line up with what His will is, His desire, and His word. Instead, we are usurping His headship and demanding that we have the right to make the choices outside of what Christ said. And if a church does that, we'll not be able to influence this world like God intends for us to influence the world. In fact, we'll be a failure when it comes to impacting this world with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me say first, wives, understand the role that Christ took when He lived in this world. That's very critical. Because when Christ, who is the eternal God, this morning in Sunday school we looked at a prophecy in the Old Testament that Christ would be born in Bethlehem and the Bible says there in that passage that he is from everlasting he is eternal and the Bible is clear that Jesus is the eternal God that he is the creator of all things the gospel of John chapter 1 without him there was nothing made that was made and yet this creator was born of a virgin and when he lived in this world he lived a life of submissiveness and by the way please don't misinterpret that word as a life of subjugation that's not what that word means whatsoever Christ entered into this world and he was fully submissive to the will of his heavenly father in fact so submissive to the will of his father that Jesus said on occasion I don't say a single word unless my father speaks it first. Now that's not, that's not saying that the husband has that kind of uh, influence over the wife. It's just demonstrating to us how that Christ was completely submissive to the will of the father. He said, I don't even say a word unless my father wants me to speak it. That's great submissiveness, isn't it? And Jesus said, I don't even do a work unless my Father first does that work. And you say, how submissive was Christ? The Bible said that he was submissive, even obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's how submissive Christ was. But let me add something to it that might help us a little bit. In Luke's Gospel, chapter number 2, verse 51... The Bible says this, after that Jesus had visited the temple and spent some days at the age of 12 conversing over the Holy Scriptures with the religious leaders of that day, the Bible says of Jesus in verse 51, and he, speaking of Jesus, went down with them, and that's speaking of his parents, and came to Nazareth, and listen, and was subject unto them. Christ, the creator of the world, when he was just a boy, when, when Mary said, Jesus, I want you to do this, he said, yes, ma'am. And when Joseph said, Jesus, I want you to go and do this, he said, whatever you want. And I, I'm telling you, when we look at the word submissive, we need to get the understanding that this is not some, some um, crude, outdated word this is really a key to being 
the Christian that God wants any single one of us to be. And, and think about how submissive that even the Creator of the world was to His Heavenly Father and then also to His earthly parents. And then secondly, I would say on this uh, line of thinking that being submissive also covers every area of life. It's amazing that when it comes to the role of husband and wife, we don't like that word, but we don't understand that really it covers every area of life. In the book of Peter, Peter's addressing believers, and he tells believers in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17, he gives us some very powerful instruction because Peter is establishing that we are not citizens here, we are citizens in heaven. We are just strangers and pilgrims in this world. Could you imagine hearing that from the Apostle Peter and you lived under the rule of the Roman government and then you got the word, our citizenship's not here, it's in heaven. If you weren't careful and you had a carnal mind, your tendency might be to say, well, then I don't have to listen to anybody in this world because I'm a citizen of heaven. How many of y'all would believe that that would probably be some way that some people would interpret that? And so Peter tenderly addresses this, and listen to what he says in 1 Peter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or as in the governors or as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you might put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness but as the servants of God Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. You see, he's saying, listen, you're free. Your citizenship is in heaven, but don't use that as a license to commit wrong and sin. He said, submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, so when the world looks at you, they'll see diligent, faithful uh, honest, law-abiding citizens, and in doing that you'll honor the Lord Jesus Christ. So submissiveness is in every area of life. Every Christian here is taught to be submissive to government authorities. If I get out on this road and the police officer steps out in the street and he, and he says, pull over, guess what that means? I can't just drive around him. <laughs> That means I'm going to have to submit to my instruction. And I don't want you to find out what happens when you just ignore him and <laughs> drive. You might find yourself in the back seat of a car with this kind of position sitting. Yeah. And we do the same thing at work. There's not one single person here that could hold down a job, right, if we are not willing to be submissive to those that God has placed over us at the workplace. Imagine going to work tomorrow, Monday morning, and they say, I want you to do this, and we really need to get this done. And you say, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and it won't be long, many responses like that, until the employee will say, the employer will say, we're going to find somebody else to fill your... So God is not saying to the wife that you have to be under the thumb of your husband. That's not, the, that's not even the tone of this passage. This passage is to spiritually mature people that really want to please God in every aspect of their life. And he's saying to the dear wife, listen, there's a vital role that you have, and that role is to understand 
that you are to be under your husband's leadership. I guess one of the simplest ways to illustrate this is Brenda has an uncle named Lewis. And Uncle Lewis was going to go in business with the man, and the man said, well, I want our business to be 50-50. And Uncle Lewis said, absolutely not. He said, either you can have 51% and I have 49, or I'll take 51 and you have 49, because when we're in business together, there are going to come a lot of times that we have to make decisions. And one of us needs to be able to say the final thing on that topic. If we, don't, if we have 50-50, our partnership is not going to last long. One of us has to take a submissive role in this business in order for this business to be... And listen, if someone that's just in a secular world understands the wisdom in that, we are to understand the wisdom of that in the home. Because you know if you're a husband or a wife, there are a multitude of decisions, and I wish it wasn't this way, right? Don't you? But there are a ton of decisions that we have to make over and over and over again. And I promise you, when you get two different personalities together, they're going to see things a lot differently than one another. And someone has to have the grace and the instruction to say, Listen, yield to the leadership of that other one so that you can maintain harmony in the home. You see, God has not put this here so the husband can be abusive or rude or unkind or ill-tempered, not whatsoever. He has put this here for us so that we can maintain harmony in our home. And when that harmony is in that home, that home is a happy home. But when two people are pulling in the opposite direction, it's not going to be long until that home begins to fall apart. And there's a vital role in, in, in realizing I must yield to the position that God has established over me. In fact, Christ does this for us so that we can understand it. He said, as the church is to be subject to Christ, Wives, take that as a, an example, as the role that you have. When, when, you, when you have a decision in that home, let that husband take the leadership position. Now, you ask my wife, and I'm very careful about this, if we have any decision to make in our home, I always seek her counsel. She always has input. Many times I have thought about doing this and I've talked to my wife and because of her wisdom I've, I've been led to make a different decision. I don't use these passages and no godly Christian man uses these passages to run roughshod over the home. You're not going to have a home long if you do that. But when a decision has to be made I realize that I'm going to be held accountable to God for that decision because God has given me that responsibility in our home. Does that make sense? And then he comes to the husbands and he says, wives, yield to your husband's leadership. And then he says, husbands, love your wives. Notice here in this text, I know he, he deals with it later in Titus when he says to the older, more mature uh, ladies in the church to teach younger women to love their children and to love their husband. But here, Paul doesn't start out with the wives and saying, love your husbands, but he says to the husbands, husbands, love your wives. And then he gives us the kind of love that he is speaking about. Not just an affection, not just a fuzzy feeling falling from the skies, but a love that is deep, a love that is sacrificial, a love that puts the wife before even his own life, his own sake. In Ephesians, Paul said, we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's interesting, and as he addresses the husband for some nine odd verses, over and over again he says to the husband, you love your wife as you would love your own self. And that's not trying to teach that husband to be selfish in his love. It's trying to get him to be selfless in his love because it's easy for us to know 
how that we prefer ourselves. It's easy for us to see how that we love ourselves and provide for ourselves and care for ourselves. And so Paul is saying, you take those natural selfish tendencies and you turn them around and you pour out your love toward your wife in these ways. You love her sacrificially. In fact, he introduces the cross again here so that we could understand the extent of the love that we are to, to share toward our wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now we don't have time this morning, but I'm sure if you'll go back and just look at the cross, you will see that that was a terrible death. That was not an easy thing for our Lord to endure. In fact, in the garden, Jesus wept and, and cried in great agony, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And the Bible said he was in great agony, one, one because of the suffering of the cross, but also because he would become the sin-bearer of the world but listen, that cross was a terrible death. It was a humiliating death. I don't even like touching on this, but if you go back and look at the crucifixion, you'll see that they derobed Christ. On the cross, He was barren to the world, and He was bruised and beaten, and then He hung there in that great humiliation, dying for your sins and my sins, and... Paul says, now you carry that same type of love into the home and you love your wife like that. And when I read that, I am greatly convicted. I see that the love that I say that I have toward my wife is nowhere near the love that Jesus had for the church. And husband, this is the greatest requirement in the Bible. We fail to forget that so often. Remember in Mark chapter 12, the lawyer came to Jesus and said, tell me, what is the greatest commandment? If you can sum up the law in just a simple statement, what is the most important commandment in the whole Bible? And Jesus said it's to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second commandment, like in the first, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the greatest commandment that could be placed on the shoulder of husbands. Husbands, love your wives. In Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul refers to this same truth but he says this, Husbands, love your wives, and listen to this, and be not bitter against them. Now if you don't, sometimes when you come to verses in the Bible, you need to do a little bit of digging because it helps you a whole lot to understand. I would look at that often and say, well, I've never been bitter at Brenda about being a husband or things like that. How does that apply to me? You look up that word and it says, Be not harsh toward them. Be not irritated at them. In other words, the husband's attitude is to be the attitude of love, not irritated, not harsh, not quick to cut off the conversation, but it is to be a, a heart that is loving and caring and giving and sacrificial. How many of you think this morning if the wife would yield to the husband's leadership and the husband would love the wife to that degree that we would all have happy homes. When he keeps saying, love your wife as your own flesh, he's trying to get the husbands to understand something. When you are united in marriage, that's in exactly what you are. You're no longer two separate individuals. But you are indeed one, one in the sight of God. And if you're going to care for your wife like you're supposed to care for your wife, you're going to care for her as though you're caring for your own flesh because, in a sense, that is the case. When God says to the Apostle Paul, speaking of the church, we are bone of Christ's bone. 
The church is flesh of Christ's flesh. In other words, he says, Church, I want you to understand something. You are as myself. And husbands, love your wives to that degree that you are going to protect your wife. Not just protect your wife against some outside attack, a robber sneaking in the home at night. The husband should be the one first to confront the robber, not the other way around, right? <laughs> to defend your wife. Not just to protect in a situation like that, but in every area of life, we are to protect her from emotional damage. She is to be protected from any sense of harm or wrong. Everything. The husband is to be her shield. He's to be her defender. He is to protect her against everything that might do her any damage whatsoever. If the husband would learn to be more protective toward his wife, we would be less likely to be irritated or harsh or short in our comments. But not only are we to protect our wives, we're also to provide for them. And in this day and hour, I know it's difficult. Most parents now, the husband and the wife, are working just to make ends meet. But provision is more than just money in the bank. No doubt it does include that. But it means that we are to care for them in every aspect of their life. And I think this is the great thing that's missing in marriages today. In marriages, the husband sometimes forgets that his role is to make his wife a better woman, to help her to grow and improve and develop in any area that she desires to grow and develop and mature but certainly in her spiritual development should be the husband's main concern. He said that Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. The word nourish means to feed. I'm glad that Christ feeds us with spiritual food, but the husband's role is to make sure that the wife is provided for, but the word cherish is an interesting word. It means to warm or keep warm. It has a picture of holding one close to one side. And we also to be a partner in life. It says, leave your father and your mother and cleave to your wife. Be determined to remain with her to the point of giving up your life. And I'm sure that many wives would love a husband that would treat them this way. And then finally, he says in the home, children, obey. Wives submit, husbands love, but children, he simply says, do what you're told. (laughs) How many of us would have happy homes if the children would do what they're told? Listen, parents, that's not the child's natural tendency. Most of you weren't born doing what you were told. Most of us are born with a rebellious heart. That's our natural tendency. And until they reach the age of accountability where they can respond to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and have their heart transformed by the power of the gospel, you're going to have to invest time and energy and patience and discipline and correction in that child's home to teach that child they cannot just give in to every selfish desire that they have. Really, I'm afraid for what's going to happen to America because most parents are basically letting the children do as they please and not realizing that they are destroying their children in the process. The only way to teach children obedience is through loving, consistent correction. The only way to take that self-willed heart and mold it into an obedient heart is through loving, consistent correction. And I'm telling you, as a parent, I have five children. Me and my wife have five children. That's not always the easiest thing to do, is it? I mean, we're tired. A lot of times we just don't want to battle ourselves, right? But the only way that you're going to guide that child to those formidable years, and that's not when they're six, seven, and eight. That's when they're one month old. (laughs) 
That's when the guiding process starts taking place, if not before that, right, Sister Francis? One month. Uh, if you're going to guide them through, you're going to have to be selfless in that loving effort. My parents used to say to me when they would spank me with the belt, that was my dad's choice of uh, discipline. They would say sometimes, it hurts me more than it hurts you. And honestly, I thought, that cannot be the case. <laughs> how many of you ever thought that? Have you ever heard those words? That hurt, this hurts me a lot more than it hurts you. And how many of you thought, no way, that's impossible. And then you had children. And then it fell on you, the responsibility of spanking them or disciplining them. And in your heart, you tried to find every reason in the world not to. And then you knew exactly what your parents were talking about. All throughout the book of Wisdom, the book of Proverbs, over and over again instructs the parents to discipline the children. Spare the rod, spoil the child. To discipline consistently, even betimes, and when you read that word betimes, it means early. It doesn't mean often, it means... <laughs> It probably needs to be early and often, but it means start when they're really young. If you think you're having problems now when they're four and five, wait till they become 15 and 16. I remember talking to my younger sister, Kim, and her children had been uh, with the grandparents and here and there, and they were getting in trouble with the law and she was wanting to try to turn things around, and they were 12 and 13 and 14, and I said to her, Kim, I'm sorry, it's too late. And she wept. She started crying. She said, don't tell me that. I said, the only thing you can do now is try to live before them in such a way that they see the change in your heart, and they'll want the same change that you've experienced through salvation. But other than God doing something miraculous in their lives, their training days are over. It's, it's gone. Some of them left home when they were only 15 years of age. And, and I'm not, I love my sister and I love her children. And I'd do anything in the world I could to help them. But you can ask my wife. They've been in jail. They've been in all kinds of difficulties. Because we don't, we don't realize that when they're real young is when they need that consistent, careful training. Wives, submit. That's, as the church is to be submissive to Christ, husbands love as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Children, obey if you're here and you say, well, I really don't listen to my mom and dad. Listen, if you don't ever learn to just obey your parents when they tell you to do something, you're never going to learn to obey God when he tells you to do something. If you're going to be a man of God or a woman of God, one of the very things, and I tell parents all the time, you need to bring your children to church because you're not just the ones trying to get them to do right. The church is also going to try to help you to get them do right, to do right. Amen? What, what a help to the home is the church if you let the church teach your children how they're to try to please God in everything. Amen? But as a, as a child, you obey your parents because God said in His Word, it is right. And He blesses that life that's obedient. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love You because You first loved